Okay, we're back. This is the last recording for the second session of the weekend class. So if those people who are listening to the video, I apologize, but the second recording did not actually work. So the last two hours of my lecture were not recorded. So everything from after lunch forward is gone. However, uh, you can go through, and I'm right now on the bhacker.com website, you can go through and uh, you can find the recordings for the weekday session. It's the same class as the weekend. So you can see subject by subject what you missed. For the last two hours after lunch, I talked about the analysis document. I talked about the design document, went through both templates, well, just the design document template. Talked about prototyping. <sighs> A little bit about the requirements for the project, but I'll repeat that in a few minutes. And uh, talked about uh, analysis and design. Finished up UML. Actually, we covered a lot. So unfortunately, um, I think because I lost my internet access, that perhaps the recording got messed up for some reason. Uh, there's a problem with my computer. And um, long story short, we are short a recording, and I'm just making sure I am recording right now. That's good. <laughs> so things appear to still be working so hopefully this will be recorded um, but anyway you can go back and um, in the coming weeks we'll see uh, this being populated with a lot more recordings and uh, for you who just came in uh, the assignments the syllabus everything is on this website go, so go ahead and go through and uh, you can get yourself up to date um, also today we announced the uh, the midterm exam and that the midterm exam is due at the end of the course, which is August, uh, in August. I think we said the 16th or the 20th uh, that we also went over on that recording that didn't record. Um, so um, I'll probably just uh, post some announcements, send some email messages out to the class, essentially. So if you are new to the class, make sure you get on the mailing list oh, and uh, sure. make sure to... There's a woman sitting in the back there. We'll get you on the attendance as well for today. Uh, so, All right, so let's finish up. Let's get the show on the road. Uh, we are talking about prototyping, our last subject for today, and what you need to do for your projects. It's a, kind of a short and sweet lecture to kind of conclude things. We're looking at prototyping, and uh, this is lecture number 16. I went through some of the other lectures. You know what? Actually, before I start, because it wasn't recorded, I'll also review what you need to know in terms of the rest of those lectures. So, You don't have to go over 15, you don't have to do 14, and you don't have to do 12. 12 is a midterm exam review. 14, I believe, is on risk assessment. 15 is on uh, metrics or something of that nature. Actually, you can add 16 to it as well. You don't have to do 16. 16, I believe, is on... Uh, oh, no. 16 is prototyping. 16 you do have to do. <laughs> it's, I believe it's 13. Let me take a look. It is, uh, six seems good. My computer's not running right today. Uh, let's see. I think I just clicked on too much stuff here for a second. Oops, I think. 16, there's 16. 13 is, uh, yeah. Uh, so what was lost in the last video was a review of lectures 9, 10, 11, and 13. All that was lost. Um, so you'll have to catch that up with the weekday video if you weren't here listening to it. And lecture 17 is the one that you don't have to go over, and I believe that's on software metrics. But let's just take this for a second. Yep, software metrics. You don't have to do lecture 17. Uh, so it's 17, 12, 14 and 15 that you can scratch off your reading list if you're watching this last video if you're on the weekend section 9, 10, 11 and 13 were what was not recorded correctly a few minutes ago for the last couple hours but we will get 16 if this video is working so any questions before we begin? from those people who were here we're still recording this, and now I'm paranoid. Yes, we're still recording. <laughs> okay, good. I just want to make sure we get some of this recorded. <laughs> All right. So this, uh, it's, it's this class is about, like, uh, SDLC something that you... Yep, 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 yep. Okay. If you read the syllabus, you'll get up to date. Or um, last class meeting last weekend uh, that mm -hmm. we had this, which was in May, mm -hmm. um, the whole thing is recorded. So you can listen to that as well. Prototyping. 
Lecture number 16. So I'm going to go through some definitions. I'm going to use the use of prototyping in the design, prototyping approaches, techniques, and some examples and what you need to do for your projects. And I'll repeat that because I know it wasn't recorded. Definitions. We have uh, a prototype should exhibit something, make something visible or comprehensible about your product, about your software. And you're building a prototype for something that doesn't exist yet. So you might be able to use it to show the features. So it should show something essential about the program. Usually it shows the user interface or some algorithm or some development. Maybe the look and feel. It should suggest what the finished application is going to look like and character, what the characteristics are. It does not have to contain any of it. It does not have to be functional. Prototypes are used for envisioning. So we can take and we can look and see. We can use it for proof of concept to say, is this actually going to work? We can use it to say, well, let's visualize. You know, something that doesn't exist yet that we may be able to imagine. So designing media systems, interfaces, pre-testing, uh, pre-testing the design. Say, hey, we have this new foot control mouse. You know, we can put it down and see, can people reach it? Can people move it? Is it actually functioning correctly? Um, in terms of envisioning in the design for visualizing the concepts, exploring alternatives, resolving feature details, and developing interactions and scenarios, use case scenarios as an example. And unfortunately, everybody who's, who's not watching here, who was watching the videos, missed all that stuff that we had on use case scenarios, I believe, too. Uh, that's, uh, I'm so bummed about that video not recording. Uh, it was a good lecture. It was long, too. Anyway, so <laughs> envisioning in the pre-testing, you can read and can you read and interpret this? Uh, can you follow this? Can you make this work? And uh, do you understand what it's doing? These are all some questions that you can be answered, hopefully, by the use of a prototype in terms of the design. Also for presentation and discussion, it provides a nice tool, just the same way as this PowerPoint presentation is providing a prototype in essence for um, explaining prototypes <laughs> and for offering discussion in terms of the, of the interface, in terms of what it is I'm trying to show information-wise. So as I mentioned, um, to you in the last video that wasn't recorded, and I'll repeat it for people watching and listening to this one. <sighs> so bummed. Anyway, I'm going to get over it. Anyway, so <laughs> for your projects, um, in there, the last video talked about the test cases. You needed to have 15 test cases added to the bottom, and then at the end of the design, actually that was in the uh, that was in the analysis documents. Ended with the 15 test cases. Your design took your analysis as a pre-design, as a rough draft, and reorganized it into different sections. There was something that said uh, user interface design, which was the last section where you can give screenshots or mock-ups. That's your prototype. Um, so we have high fidelity and we have low fidelity prototypes so I'm going to talk about in a few minutes. But for your projects, you need to create a low fidelity, which means you can do it with pen and paper. You can use PowerPoint for it. You can do screen mock-ups if you want, but you don't have to. You can do one screen. You can do all the screens. You want to mimic, you want to or not mimic, um, explain something about the system that you're building. You're not implementing the system. You're not even making a prototype for the whole thing. The easiest thing for you to do would actually be a screen mock-up. Create a screen. You can do that in PowerPoint. You can do it in Word, anything you want. It can be a Word document. It doesn't have to be PowerPoint either. So. And it, it, the type of prototype that it represents would be for envisioning or presentation and discussion. If we were doing a um, peer, uh, excuse me, if we were doing an interview, interview, if we were doing a presentation, which we're not doing, you don't have to present. For those of you who haven't looked at the syllabus yet, and I, this is also in the video that was lost, there were no class presentations this term. Um, you have the midterm, the final, and the project, but no presentation. Fidelity is a prototype, so what do I mean by high and low? I've just mentioned them. So high fidelity versus low fidelity prototyping. The degrees of fidel fidelity tell us the functionality. So when we go from low to high, we have an increase in functionality. We have more implementation going on. A greater set of allowable inputs, more realism in the interaction, greater detail of visual appearances and things of that nature. Here's a low fidelity prototype. This is what you're doing for your project. You don't have to do it this way. This is scanned copies of bar napkins and pieces of paper and stuff. <laughs> I personally would use a PowerPoint, maybe. I don't know. Paint is a good prototyping tool. 
Some people actually go as far as Visual Basic and they take screenshots because Visual Basic allows you to kind of do you know, the window motif and yeah, grab it on the canvas. You don't have to actually have a working program in Visual Basic. You just do the screens. No functionality at all. I take pictures of it, screens capture shots or something if you wanted to. So the use of standard office products, supplies, no computers involved, no testing. Testing is done by the team itself. And then we have higher degrees. Here's a one-dimensional. One-dimensional uses scenarios, scripts, tools. So we're going from a flat paper base to something where one-dimensional is usually on a computer. With a, it's usually represented in where a computer, a human can actually play the computer, maybe, or simulate something somehow. Um, you don't have to do one-dimensional, but this is different types as what I'm going through now. Two-dimensional might be a drawing, a sketch, a screenshot. Storyboards. That's where you have this screen goes to this screen goes to this screen. Usually in web design, people put together storyboards to show the site map and how the site's going to be assembled. It's collection screenshots or something. Three-dimensional. No one's going to do this, I hope. Uh, you can if you want. You don't have to do it, but you can do a low-fidelity you know, this is paint, you know. Um, or you could do a high fidelity, it's your choice. Given the choice, most people will just use PowerPoint. 3D tools, puppets, physical models, computer animations, there's demo software out there. People make some pretty sophisticated, it looks like a real running program, but it isn't. Or video, recording a video on the program actually would be a prototype as well. And three dimensional usually has some sort of interaction to it as well. It might actually be considered rapid prototyping. Google actually does what would be considered a high fidelity of 3, 3D types of prototypes. In fact, Gmail started out as a prototype. Now it's the full product. It was an evolutionary prototype that was very high fidelity. We also have prototyping software tools. Not very common. The only thing I would say that's currently being used, and it's interesting, Visual Basic, that was a programming language, turned into a prototyping tool for a large degree. It's still being used as a programming language. People develop applications in it. Director and Flash has started out as prototyping tools, turned into programming languages. <laughs> People have Flash applications more so than they're not using it. It's too hard. Flash and Direct are way too hard to use. Either one of them is way too hard to use as a prototyping language. But very feature-rich. You're going to put it into a full application at this point. Web-based prototyping, not done very much because you just create the website if you're going to do it. <laughs> Dreamweaver, again, too much work for what a Java apple, so one uses applets anymore either. Um, HyperCard doesn't, not support it anymore. Gone completely. So, programming has really changed over the years. It's either gone one stream or the other, and the languages and the tools have gone in weird directions too. So, HyperCard doesn't essentially merit any discussion because the program doesn't exist, but it was one of the only programs out there. In fact, let me just skip to the examples here. These look like little 3 by 5 cards that tell you pieces about... It created a storybook, essentially. They were cards, again, kind of like the CRC cards, that uh, you kind of put together you know, hyper cards so you can move them around and can click on them and stuff, and it kind of mimicked the website design or the program design. I don't know about Director. The only problem with Director, it actually came before Flash. It's more, it's, it's, um, has different features, supported animation. It was actually for movie editing, for metaphors for actors and stages and stuff. It was accessible by non-programmers. -program, it used a lingo. It's a scripting language. Extensible object-oriented system. Lingo language is not easily accessible to non-programmers. <laughs> The audience for director initially was for artists, for uh, movie playwright people. Yeah, that's why it's called director. And it didn't go over well because computer users, computer programmers use it. <laughs> not arts, art and science. I mean, not artsy people. And I need two versions of it for cross-platform compatibility between the Mac and the PC. Didn't work on the internet either. And then we had Flash. Everybody knows about Flash these days. There's a huge controversy over who, what browser is going to support it, and what, how come Microsoft doesn't support it. I don't even know why Microsoft doesn't support it. Seriously, a lot of applications were built Microsoft in it. Or not? I mean, Apple. I didn't mean that. Microsoft. Uh, 
Apple, like the iPad, it's not supported on. I meant to say Apple. Microsoft supports it all, over, yeah. all across the board. Um, Flash is better suited for interface design development. Tends to bog down when a lot of elements are on the screen. Director is better for game development. In fact, a lot of games were developed in Director, still, even today. It's a complicated interface for programming. Director is much stronger than Flash, actually. Flash sacrifices some of the UI controls for the ease of use. It's not easier than, to use than Director, but it's about as feature, it's not as feature rich, although it's easier to use. So they stripped it out uh, in terms of uh, Flash and Director. So Flash is significantly cheaper as well. In fact, the plugins and everything is supported by most browsers these days, except for the Apple. <laughs> Less powerful. No 3D modeling and animation with Director supported that. So you actually have to use 3D modeling and stuff. It's stripped down, but it's more user-friendly, I think, actually more extendable. No XML support for it. Uh, less access to hardware resources. It's cross-platform compatible through web browser support. So multiple timelines. Scripting language is ActionScript. A little bit easier to learn in Lingo, essentially. So Visual Basic. No, is it a scripting language or is it a programming language? Create some pretty heavy duty large applications. It's part of Visual Studio.net though and it works quite well with ASP. So Visual Basic is still a powerful programming language. However, people are using it as a uh, prototyping language as well. But don't say that to a Visual Basic programmer, they'll be offended. You know, they think programming in Visual Basic requires programming skill. It does. No, it's not like C++, though. No, it's not like Java. So. Not as feature-rich as a language, either. So you can't write a device driver in Visual Basic. You can write a DLL in C++ or C. Web-based prototyping tools. Tons of them out there, actually. Uh, they're all over the place, actually. They're all HTML or XML supported. In fact, there's a lot of XML prototyping tools out there, too. Dreamweaver being one of them. Dreamweaver is kind of expensive. Not what I'd call a cheap solution for a prototype. But if you happen to have Dreamweaver and you're doing web development, then yeah, you can create a prototype pretty easily in it. What are some prototyping goals? Well, you're going to show a scenario. So this is what you're doing with your paper and pencil or your high fidelity. You're showing a scenario, some characteristics about the system that may not be easy to see without it. Uh, you're striking a balance. You're choosing appropriate level of detail to illustrate your idea to the users. This is traditional prototyping goals, by the way. Uh, you're picking out only the important features and you're concentrating on executing those well, hopefully. Practical prototyping, you want to remain flexible, hopefully. And uh, remembering that your first prototype will not be your last. And your materials and your implementation, you're being practical about it. Not too frugal, but not too over, over extensible on it. Here's some interface prototyping examples of a uh, storyboard implemented in HTML. So we have multiple user interfaces, iteration, based on uh, feedback, hopefully. So you go through multiple different designs. This is what we have. This is what we're looking for. This is our first try. This is our second time. And you can kind of see the progression and sometimes if you use this technique. In terms of the prototyping for your project, as I mentioned before, uh, what type of project prototype will you need? Here's a software prototype. You don't need one. But I would do it using software. This means you don't take out the 3 by 5 cards or the pieces of paper. And you if you do that, scan it in the computer, you turn it into software. <laughs> turn it into a scanned image. Um, what do you need? Uh, some type of tool. You're going to need some sort of software tool to do a scanner, Microsoft Project or something, or excuse me, PowerPoint. You should implement so the user look and feel, maybe, and also the features to show the overall functionality if you can. Again, you don't have to show everything. Just show something. It's a, Exam it's an opportunity to give you some uh, information and some practice creating prototypes. Here's one right here. So you can prototype the design. So it illustrates a lot of the design of the interface and it allows presentation to the user, which was the original intention of the prototype for your project, but we don't have the presentation, so you don't have to worry about that. You're just creating it as if you were going to do it. And the Wizard of Oz method has the designer simulate the behavior as well as the appearance of the system. So. Wizard of Oz, you know, kind of give you, here it is, but it's not built yet. <laughs> and this is what it looks like, and this is how you use it. And you're animating some sort of benefit, hopefully. Otherwise, you're wasting your time with a prototype. You could create a prototype and easily discover problems for the users. 
you know, you give the prototype out to a bunch of beta users, test users, and you look at it and they go, ooh, can't figure it out. How do you print? And they can't figure out how to use, if they can't figure out how to use a prototype, they can't figure out how to use a main product either. So it might suggest some improvements that might be made before the product is finished. It may also be used as a development tool and a system tester, proof of concept, all sorts of different other um, validation process tools. It may serve as a stop gap for the system. So let's go back to that mouse driven by a foot prototype. Now we all use our fingers and our hands to drive a mouse, but this is actually real. Somebody came up with a prototype for a foot mouse. Completely bad idea. <laughs> Very bad idea. Not only would people not take their shoes off to use the mouse, I wouldn't do it either. <laughs> I barely like to touch a mouse with my hands that's sitting on somebody else's desk. But the whole concept, we don't have as much dexterity in our legs and our feet as we do in our hands. Bad idea, bad idea. But the prototype was a stopgap for it. And, uh, people's, we don't see any foot mice on there. I believe or not, though, if you could do a Google search, you see some product prototypes, but you never really see a true product on the market. They do make some, though, and it did work out because uh, disabled people who can't have, don't have arm support can't. There's a foot option for them. There is one on the market, actually, but it's not designed towards the general public. So. Uh, it reveals requirements, inconsistencies, and incompleteness as well, especially when you say it's supposed to do this, but you can't do it. <sighs> or it's supposed to do that, but it doesn't work properly or something. You could also use the prototype to test. So you test the prototype. So you have scenarios and you have role playing. There's no substitute for user testing. So you can come up with a test and create a prototype to help with the testing to see. If we input it this way and we do it this way and we do it that way, then do we get this? This is what we want. So you can use it to um, similar backgrounds of the users, hopefully, of your system. And you can kind of mimic what ends up happening when they actually get the real product, hopefully. So testing will reinforce or contradict your expectations so you learn from the process, hopefully. Benefits of testing. Testing will expose problems, hopefully. So you can... And this is what's considered the rapid application development these days. Where we design something, we create a prototype, we evaluate it. We design it, create a prototype, we evaluate it. We kind of go in circles, trying to get everything done on it. And uh, what ends up happening is we, we discover, we change, we learn. So the prototyping doesn't necessarily lead to a deliverable. It's more of a process, kind of like analysis. Prototyping is very similar. It can aid in a lot of different components or different areas of the software. So. Beware of interactions between design elements. Fixing one may break another. So you can kind of use it to test if the fix is actually good and so going in the right direction. So. And as promised, that was extremely quick. <laughs> For those of you who have been here all day, uh, that's a lot of information. Yes? You had a question? No, oh, I thought I saw a hand go up. Oh. Or was that a high five? <laughs> it was a, yeah, she's done. <laughs> Hopefully that recorded. I'm kind of bummed about my previous recordings. All right, so if you have uh, been paying attention, we have another class meeting, actually, that's going to come up. So I'll conclude this class meeting by talking about the next class meeting, if I can find it. Under here we go. So for those of you who missed May 21st weekend, that's been recorded. June 18th, which was today, weekend has been recorded. July 16th is our final exam, and you're going to get an email between now and July 16th. It's less than a month away, where this is likely today's the 18th. Well, it's approximately a month. I don't know how many days there are in June, but uh, <laughs> I guess if I did the math, I'd figure it out. But anyway, long story short, you're going to get a time slot on the 16th. You just show up on the 16th. There's no class on the 17th. So you plan to be here on Saturday, so you arrive Friday night. You come in, one of your time slots can be, uh, it's, it, the exam will take about an hour, hour and a half to, for you to take. If you don't like your time slot, you can request another time slot. Tell me when you're going to show up. You'll receive an email message, and you'll also receive some information out here that'll show, and it's the alphabetical group of your last name. Like you'll be set, put in different groups, and you'll be able to you know, show up, hit the exam. And uh, the exam, as I mentioned before to people earlier, um, it's closed notes, excuse me, open book, open notes, closed neighbor. 
So, and it'll be an essay short answer type format instead of a multiple choice. But I haven't written the exam yet, so I don't know. So I'll have more information on the exam as we get closer. But uh, you guys will take it on the 16th of July, which is our last interactive class meeting session. However, the class doesn't actually end until August 20th, I believe. So your projects, your midterm, your CSLO, all your other deliverables are due at the end of August. They're not due on July 16th. Especially for those people who just started the course. You know, like less than a month, you got to turn in the project, the midterm, take the final, and this seems very fast. So you have until the end of the term. And what you're doing is you're following the same schedule as the weekday, although we are, our meetings have been kind of set you know, at the beginning of the term. Questions about anything? How is your opportunity? Yes? Uh, the analysis document that I was going over that was not recorded, I'm just kidding, is <laughs> in we have the syllabus, we have the midterm, we have course notes right here. It's about 160 or 133 pages, I think, of notes. You want to download for you, you want to download this one. If you go into lectures link, you'll see all the lectures for the course. And I gave you the ones that um, you don't have to do. You have the project files here, some design examples. There's an example. And a data flow diagram, entity relationship diagram. That was recorded from earlier this morning from before the break. Um, you'll be able to see that. And also, you know, what you can do is you can go through here and you can see in the next couple weeks we're going to be covering the material that was not recorded today that pertains to the object-oriented analysis and the design document and stuff. And you'll see that. So you'll be able to see the uh, slower version of it on the weekday, but it'll take a couple weeks for it to be populated. Let's see. And then uh, we'll have our recordings up here in the next couple days. I'll upload today's stuff. So yeah, this class for some reason seems to have gone extremely quickly. I think because we started it in May. Maybe. So I don't know. It just seems like it's flown by. It's like I'm already talking about the midterm and the final exam already. You know, as soon as I start talking about the final exam, all of a sudden it's like, saying, whoa, class is almost over. This feels like we just got started. Some people just registered for the course last week. <laughs> and we're talking about the final exam already. So, wow, that does seem pretty fast. Any other questions, problems, concerns, <clears throat> issues, suggestions? Mm -hmm. Want to go till 6 tonight? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Anybody else? You guys ready to go? I know you just got here. I'm not going to ask you. How about the rest of you? Are you ready? Mm -hmm. All right, well, we're done. We're done, and hopefully we got this recorded. Let's see.